I am Arian Mack. I'm a, I'm a professor of psychology here at the New School at the division called the New School for Social Research. I'm the editor of Social Research and organizer of today's conference, which, as you know, is called Climate Change Demands We Change, Why Aren't We? And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the New School and to this, our 31st conference in our social research conference series, which we began in 1988. Social research has been the journal of the New School for Social Research for a very long time, actually since 1934, when it was launched by the first president of the New School, Alvin Johnson, with the small group of exiled scholars whom he had managed with great foresight and a great deal of effort to bring out of Germany to the New School to protect them from the <coughs> savagery that was beginning to unfold in Europe. Most of those he brought here had already lost their positions with the imposition of racial laws. This group, which was known as the University in Exile in 1933, became the graduate faculty of the social and political sciences in 1934, and for some reason, more recently, was renamed the New School for Social Research. Um, so, it was Alvin Johnson who believed that the faculty needed a journal, which would be its public voice, and it would serve as uh, and it was to serve this goal, namely to be a public voice, that we decided to initiate this conference series. Our mission from the start was the fostering of public discussions of matters of serious public concern by exploring these issues in terms of their immediate import and whenever possible within their historical and cultural contexts. Papers from the conference, this conference and all our conferences are published in special issues of social research, which you can order in the lobby just outside the auditorium and where you can also subscribe. We, we encourage you to do so, obviously. Since 2010, the conference series has been organized under the auspices of the Center for Public Scholarship, which is a new uh, center at the new school. Uh, which I direct and which is intended to be an intellectual crossroads for academics, students, public and policy makers, bringing the best scholarship to bear on critical and contested issues. A mission, I think, deeply rooted in the history and ideals of the New School. Now to, to today's conference and a word about the choice of our topic, which probably needs no explanation, since there is, I think, no more urgent issue confronting us today than that of climate change. Nevertheless, governments, corporations, and the public seem very reluctant to change. In addition, and in addition, while a great deal of research has been devoted to issues of engineering, architecture, land use, et cetera, as ways of mitigating the effects of climate change, all of which is, of course, immensely important, less attention has been paid to the ways psychological factors, <clears throat> money and politics and infrastructures, impede change. In this conference, it is these issues that we will be front and center, as well as the difficult cho choices that we'll, we're going to have to make. Once selecting our subject, the planning for this conference was done in consultation with a group of advisors from the faculty at the New School, all of whom are members of our Climate Change Coalition, which we call C6. It's the acronym for the New School's coalition, uh, for the coalition to confront climate change challenges in cities. C6 brings together faculty and students from across all divisions of the New School who are teaching, doing research, and in general focusing on climate change. And uh, that we have a, uh, a website within the New School's website which uh, does um, list all the things going on at the New School around issues of climate change. Most importantly, this conference, like all its predecessors, would not have been possible without the generous support and advice from knowledgeable people. I am deeply grateful to our advisors who helped craft the agenda 
And most of all, I am grateful to the VK Rasmussen Foundation for their generous financial support, without which this conference would never have happened. I remind you that this morning's session is only the first of five. We will continue today. This session ends at two, and we then continue at three with session two about the physical city. Uh, at six, we host the keynote address given by Francis Beinecke, president of NRDC. And tomorrow, we host another two sessions addressing money in politics and uh, as roadblocks to change and difficult choices. Now, finally, let me introduce my colleague and very good friend, Emanuele Castano, who will be moderating our first session. Emanuele is a professor of psychology here at the New School for Social Research and the director of the Cognitive Social and Developmental <coughs> Psychology Program at the New School for Social Research. It is my pleasure to welcome him to the podium for him to introduce the first session and the speakers. Thank you, Thank you Arian. Um, Welcome, everybody. It's a honor to, to jumpstart this conference on climate change. You, you heard from Arian. Um, and there is one thing we know about Arian um, is that she, te she tells it uh, exactly as it is. And uh, in the invitation um, to this conference, she simply says climate change is the most urgent issue of our time. Can you hear me? Systems. Get closer to the mic, probably will work too. Thank you. So, accordingly, there is no better way you could spend your morning and, and hopefully the day than, than um, here with us to discuss this um, fundamental issue that we are confronted with. We, as, as a civilization, uh, we, have, we have worked so hard and thus far um, quite successfully to avoid uh, other existential threats, uh, such as an all out nuclear war in the past. Uh, we have responded with all our scientific and technological might to ferocious diseases um, of all kinds that had the potential to wipe out humankind, either containing them or uh, even reversing trends. Uh, we have done this by changing the world around us and by changing ourselves uh, in the process. We have done this many times in the past. Yet, uh, as Arian pointed out, we are confronted now with this very urgent issue that truly threatens us all. And we have been capable of very uh, little change. So the first panel for this conference um, addresses specifically this question by focusing on the change that needs to happen uh, within ourselves. What needs to change and how can we get there? These are the questions that are common to all our four panelists today. To this end, the, the panel comprised of four exceptional thinkers who, who, whose work contributes directly to the question at hand. The first speaker, I'll briefly introduce them uh, now, and then, uh, of course, I'll um, give the podium to the first speaker. Our first speaker will be Elke Weber, who is a Jerome Chazen Professor of International Business um, at the Columbia Business School and Professor of Psychology at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. Professor Weber is a world-renowned expert in decision making, and will tell us why we often uh, come to poor decisions, especially when risk is involved and the situation is uncertain, which seems to me quite a permanent feature of human life, uh, but it's certainly even more true uh, in this context. A lot of uncertainty, great risk. Um, her focus on cognitive and affective uh, factors in decision making process um, is complemented by the next speaker, uh, Paul Stern. Professor Stern is director of the Standing Committee on the Human Dimensions of Global uh, Climate Change and the National Research Council in the National Academies of Science. Like Weber, Professor Stern has uh, made landmark contributions to the debate around decision making in the context of climate change. His focus today uh, is on the complexity of the phenomenon at hand and what can be done to exchange, sorry, to enhance knowledge um, of this situation and better understand what uh, to do so that we can respond to it effectively. Our third speaker is John Jost. 
Professor Justice, uh, Professor of Psychology at New York uh, University. Um, he is uh, the director, um, is Professor of Psychology uh, and Politics. He's co-director of the Center for Social and Political Behavior at NYU. Over the last two decades, uh, Professor Jost has made significant contributions to the understanding of ideology. And today, he will discuss how resistance to change, which is a psychological tendency strictly related in his work to uh, ideology, how this resistance to change can be um, very much in the way of progress when it comes to implement changes in ourselves in response to the climate change threat. Finally, uh, certainly not least, um, we have uh, Jennifer Jacquet, who is clinical professor uh, in environmental studies at NYU as well. Dr. Jacquet, uh, an environmental uh, scientist, is about to publish a book on the function of shame <clears throat> and how it can impact um, our decision-making process. She will tell us, um, she will talk us through a series of experiments designed to test what kind of sacrifices we are ready to make or we are not ready to make uh, in order to keep ourselves uh, above water in the foreseeable future. Um, so this is our terrific lineup. Um, I will invite Elga, um, Elke Weber in a second. Uh, the, the format of this panel is such that uh, every speaker has about 20 minutes to present his work, his ideas, and his suggestions on how to fix this, um, or at least address, or beginning to address this um, uh, fundamental issue. Um, at the end of the four uh, speeches, we will take questions. Maybe we'll start the discussion among the speakers for a few minutes, and then uh, please line up uh, and the two sides at the mic, uh, and I will moderate um, the sessions, taking questions from the audience. Without further ado, <laughs> Professor Weber. Uh, thank you, Emmanuel uh, and Arian, uh, for uh, introducing this uh, session. And uh, I'm both uh, honored uh, and also highly pleased to be here to start off this event with, us, with you. Uh, climate change, uh, as Arian already told us, and for some reason we're only seeing the bottom part of our slides, so I'll tell you what's on the top. <laughs> Uh, but climate change really uh, is the looming challenge of the 21st century. Okay, much better. Uh, let me give a little shout out to a very interesting play that's right now playing at the, the public theater, The Great Immensity. The Great Immensity is the name of a ship in this play, but it's also a metaphor you know, for what climate change really is and will be to us uh, in this coming century. The magnitude of the required response, you know, change, in us, but also change in our social systems, in our economic systems, in our technology, uh, is so large that it oftentimes overwhelms us. And I think sort of this feeling that there's little we can do uh, in light of the magnitude of the challenge is something that actually immobilizes us, yeah, and we can maybe sort of talk about in our discussion. Uh, it also, you know, sort of, given that the challenge is large uh, and the solutions seem small and puny uh, in comparison, uh, that means also that we're inviting any kind of reason to turn away from it. Yeah? And so to switch channels uh, or to focus on the uncertainty, maybe the barbarians are not quite at the gates yet, yeah? or maybe the challenge isn't so large. Uh, and there are uncertainties. Yeah, there are uncertainties uh, in the climate system response to our current accelerating emission of, of, of carbon. Uh, there are challenges in the availability of technology down the road you know, to sort of address you know, either uh, mitigation you know, or adaptation to it. Uh, and uh, then the other sort of element that's unique about this particular challenge is the barbarians are at the gate, but the barbarians are really us. <laughs> so we are the enemy. You know, we are the enemy in, in multiple ways. First of all, we uh, arguably, perhaps in some minds, but I think sort of with 95% certainty, we have caused this problem. We continue to cause this problem. Uh, so it's our actions uh, that need to be addressed. But also it's our human nature, and this is what this session is about, uh, that needs to be fought and overcome because this challenge is different from other challenges we've faced in the past. Uh, if I just, just make sort of one analogy to uh, the, the large challenge, uh, one of the large challenges of the 20th century, German militarism, uh, there we knew the barbarians were at the gate. They were somebody else that needed to be addressed. But I took a personal attack on the United States, you know, uh, the sinking of the Lusitania in World War I, or of course Pearl Harbor in World War II, to actually trigger that response. So it's not quite so easy to get people to act. We all know that. Um, I think one of the reasons why we're having this conference right now is you know, this, this year, uh, uh, different uh, 
reports of the IPCC, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, have come out. This is a fifth assessment report, uh, and you know, really the uh, accumulation of evidence that climate change is something that is not just happening in the future, but is happening now, and that it's something that's affecting not just polar bears uh, and future generations, but us, uh, uh, I think is sort of becoming increasingly evident. Uh, and uh, when you read editorials like the one in the New York Times, uh, when the, uh, the, the current uh, third, uh, the, the third volume of the assessment report came out, uh, the editorial said the American public perhaps now will at last fully accept that global warming is in danger now and an even graver threat to future generations. Uh, and a lot of focus right now is, is on the conference of the parties. You know, the, the next one is in Lima at the end of this year. But there's a lot of hope that maybe in, tw in, in uh, 2015, in Paris, there will be a supranatural agreement that, 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 that will limit climate change analogous to Kyoto. Um, all of these assumptions and analyses assume that we are rational. Yeah? And it's not to say that we don't make decisions in a rational fashion. And in fact, we have policymakers, yeah, we have uh, experts that are designed to help us make these decisions, acquire the evidence, uh, and, and, and have processes in place that, that will weigh costs against benefits, uh, current and future, discounting them appropriately. Uh, but I think one thing that we'll argue in this panel today is that Homo sapiens is not primarily a creature of rational deliberation. Yeah? Uh, instead, we're creatures of habit. Yeah, we do things by trial and error. That's how evolution works. Uh, we learn by getting hurt. We learn by dying off. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the useful mutations live on. Uh, and we use our emotions uh, as early warning systems. Yeah, if it feels scary, we... Uh, run away, if it feels good, we approach, we want more. Uh, and oftentimes rules of thumb, rules of conduct, moral rules of conduct, professional rules of conduct uh, to guide our actions. Uh, we have a lot of uh, goals. You know, it's not that we don't know what we want, we want too many things, and oftentimes quite conflicting things. And so yes, we have material goals for ourselves. Uh, we have social goals. You know, we are concerned about future generations, just not all the time. Uh, we have environmental goals. We care about our flora and fauna, the stewardship of the earth. Uh, we also have process goals, yeah? and so feeling in control is something that's important to us, that we actually we need that feeling to, 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 to exist, to go up, get up in the morning, and yet climate change is something that makes us feel out of control because of the, the, the issues I raised before. It's so large, what can any, any individual, any country do in isolation? And that uncertainty is adverse, aversive to us, and so again, the tendency to t turn away from it. Uh, one thing that's interesting is you know, these, of, oftentimes these goals are in, in opposition and in conflict with each other. Material goals and environmental goals sometimes are seen as conflicting. Uh, they can be aligned to some extent, but oftentimes there are trade-offs to be made, and we don't like trade-offs either. We want it all. We want our cake and eat it too. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind uh, as we think about how to change our behavior is that it's the active goals at any given point in time that determine our decisions, which is, of course, also why our decisions sometimes look uh, contradictory to each other, because different goals are active at different points in time. Um, okay, climate change action, it's a really tough nut to crack. Yeah, basically, if we can solve our action problem in this domain, everything else is icing on the cake. Pension savings, uh, the obesity epidemic, you know, sort of all of these things, you know, if we can solve this problem, because the costs in this case are upfront, they're tangible, they're certain, uh, the benefits of action uh, are uncertain, they are somewhat disputed by different parties, uh, and they are in the future, and we discount them. Uh, all of these problems that I raised, these social issues, have that characteristic, and that makes them very hard. Because our focus, uh, evolutionarily, is on the here and now. We have finite processing capacity, we have finite emotional capacity, and it makes sense to focus that limited capacity, to husband it carefully on the here and now. Because we, if we don't survive today, we're not gonna be around to sort of to, to, to plan for the future. And yet, as our problems become more complex, we have to sort of learn, either individually or collectively, by outsourcing different types of decisions, we have to learn to distribute our attention uh, with more of a focus on the future. Yeah? Because automatically, we, 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 we are myopic. Um, 
there are no silver bullets in, in this situation as in any other ones. Yeah, so uh, this c conference of the parties in Paris is not going to solve our problems, yeah, even if we come up with an agreement. Uh, and the devil will be in the details. The details will be how to ratify this agreement yeah, in individual countries, how to implement yeah, so the ratified uh, uh, limits that we put on carbon emissions yeah, at the individual level, at the city level, yeah, at the company level. The, le the devil is in the details, and that means sustained attention over time, which again is not something that we do very very well. Uh, and so the structure of this type of issue uh, basically uh, leads to a status quo bias. Uh, we all are stick in the mud. I don't like change. You know, when there's a new update on my software, I, my, my tendency is not to update. Uh, but I've learned to basically do what my IT guy is telling me. I've delegated that decision because I know I don't like change. And three weeks later, I will actually be glad to update it because I have lots of new features to play with. Yeah? But the bottom line is we have to anticipate that people uh, will be opposed to any kind of change uh, ex ante. That's a fundamental challenge, how to deal with, uh, with uh, the status quo bias. Uh, sometimes interventions can be found in the diagnosis of a problem. That's why we go to a doctor to find out what, what's the problem, and then depending on what the problem is, we, we get the uh, appropriate medicine. Uh, so let's ask ourselves, why, why is there status quo bias? Well, typically, uh, we persist in what we're doing because that's a safe course of action. Yeah? The, the, we, we know what we, what, 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 what we have available. Uh, any kind of change means there's uncertainty. And again, uncertainty is something that is scary and, and could lead to negative consequences. The pernicious thing is that inaction and status quo bias in the case of climate change is precisely not the safe option. Yeah, we know that if we persist in our uh, business as usual right now in terms of carbon emissions, uh, in 50 to 100 years' time, there will be serious uh, challenges to our current way of being because of you know, increasing droughts, because of increasing sort of uh, uh, other uh, severe events, uh, hurricanes, uh, and social consequences that go with those. Already, you know, we have wars in, 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 in Syria that are partly determined by, by, by droughts in the countries preceding them. So we, we're seeing this process already in action. It's going to get a lot worse. Now, if we don't sort of rationally do something about that, uh, and if much of our uh, behavior is actually influenced by emotions, then the question is, well, is this an argument for scaring people into action? Uh, and certainly we've seen uh, a lot of that tactic in, in operation the day after tomorrow uh, at a sort of, you know, very dramatic scale, uh, but also the years of living dangerously, the Al Gore campaigns. Yeah, these are sort of deeply uh, disturbing uh, uh, presentations, uh, images that we see. Uh, and uh, uh, we certainly uh, get motivated to pay attention to them. Negative emotions are uh, attention-getting. Fear is a strong uh, attention grabber. Uh, but it's really only useful uh, as a technique, uh, as, a, as an appeal to motivate action, if there's a very simple thing that we can do to get us out of the danger. Yeah? Because uh, if we have to engage in a range of options you know, over uh, months or years in time, nobody wants to be in that negative mood state. You know, we basically, again, the, the, the uh, appeal is to just switch channels and think about something else. And remember, remember in the climate uh, solution space, there is no silver bullet. There's, there are only silver buckshots, uh, action across a whole range of things. Uh, we have a finite pool of worry. We can only worry about so many things at any given point in time. And so as we worry more about climate change, we actually neglect other issues. We might neglect the state of our marriage, or we might ne neglect civil rights. Yeah, so the question is, what is the appropriate balance of attention to this issue? And also, when we do something out of fear, a flag goes up. Uh, but as soon as we do something, the flag tends to go down. So there's a single action that we sort of tend to engage in. And again, what we need here in this space is sustained <laughs> silver buckshot approaches, not a single action. Uh, the other question you can ask yourself also is how does the status quo bias come about? Yeah, is there some sort of causal process model that tells us why is it that we sort of pers persevere so much in, in, in our current actions? Uh, query theory is something I've developed uh, with Eric Johnson over the last 10 years or so. It's a framework that basically shows that oftentimes we make decisions as an implicit and automatic process of arguing with ourselves. We marshal evidence about action A, about action B, and then depending on which, which uh, scale has more evidence in it, should we do A, should we do B, we go in that direction. Uh, sometimes consciously, but most of the time just automatically. The, the evidence comes from past experience, comes from external sources. Uh, the bottom line is that the first option, the first choice option you consider, tends to garner more evidence for a variety of reasons we don't have time to talk about. Uh, but the million dollar question then in any situation is which choice option gets considered first? Okay? And one really sort of strong answer to that question is the status quo. 
Yeah? Uh, that makes a lot of sense. If it's a behavioral status quo, we've been doing, been doing something for a while. It hasn't killed us yet. It can't be all that dangerous. Uh, we had some good reasons to do it in the first place. Uh, but if that's a process, yeah, sort of the status quo gets considered first, well, is that then an argument for maybe changing the status quo on people? Uh, don't allow them to persevere with our current status quo. Well, status quo bias oftentimes also really shows a lack of imagination because sort of if we think about change, we just extrapolate from our current you know, sort of uh, way of thinking. Here's Henry Ford saying, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. Now, uh, ugly, we could sort of say, well, we would have been better off with faster horses. <laughs> uh, but. <laughs> Uh, certainly at the time, you know, sort of the invention of the automobile was, was, a, was a good idea. Uh, let me give you a, a couple of other examples of bold uh, policies. Uh, our own Mayor Bloomberg in 2002 decided that smoking in public places and restaurants and bars was a, a public health hazard. Uh, and he announced that there would be a, a smoking ban. Uh, was uh, greeted with a lot of uh, outrage at the time. The entertainment industry was opposed to it. People <coughs> didn't want to be nannied uh, about what they could or couldn't do in, in, in public spaces. Uh, and also in 2008, uh, the British Columbia uh, provincial government imposed a carbon tax. Uh, it was revenue neutral, yeah, but it, it, it did discourage the use of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, uh, greenhouse gases. And uh, in both cases, there was a huge outcry against this initiative. And the question is, what happened? So we did a, recently we did a media, media analysis looking at these two issues um, being reported in three uh, newspapers uh, in, in the area, in New York City uh, and in British Columbia. Uh, and what you see is, but at the time of announcement, uh, to the time of implementation, you know, so this big band of things, public opinion drops precipitously. So there's, an out, it's, there's basically people are status quo biased, they're saying, we don't want change, we hate change, and they, they, they generate all sorts of arguments against change and for the status quo, which query theory would predict. Now the question is, what happens when you now say, I don't care what you're doing, I'm rich, I'm gonna do this anyway, if you're Mayor Bloomberg, I don't need to get reelected, and you impose, you, know, you change the status quo, Query say would argue, well, now that this new state of action is in place, after a while you start to think about, well, what's good about that? Because we first consider what's currently in place in front of us. Yeah? And the question is, is this actually happening? And how long does it take before the new status quo becomes the default? Uh, people think about it more in arguments for it first, and, and, and plus they get feedback hopefully these policies were enlightened and actually increased public welfare. Uh, how long does it take before public opinion becomes net positive? Well, in this case, you see it took about 400 days, that's uh, 14 months, uh, and that's typically sort of long enough in an election cycle that an enlightened civil servant might actually sort of stick out his neck. Uh, what about in British Columbia? Uh, there, it, again, public opinion plummeted. Uh, it, it bottomed out at implementation. It took nine months for public opinion to become net positive, and this premier did get re-elected yeah, in, in the next election cycle. So we talked earlier about multiple ways in which we make decisions, and we talked about sometimes making decisions with our heads. Yes, we do sometimes think about costs and benefits and, and, and do calculations. Uh, and sometimes we do things by the heart, sometimes we do things by the book. Uh, we also delegate decisions. We do make decisions by experts. We go to a doctor to get a medical diagnosis. You know, we go to a lawyer with our legal issues. Well, why do we have politicians? You know, some people think it's a rhetorical question, uh, but we have politicians basically because we realize that we're bad at our long-term planning and, 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 and long-term policy. So we have outsourced our long-term uh, public policy decisions to politicians, to, to policy makers, but they really are, at this point, falling down on the job, talking about uh, different goals being uh, in conflict. Yes, they do want to do what's best for uh, their, their constituents, but they also want to get re-elected. Yeah? Uh, and uh, politicians and policy makers uh, sort of basically are following public opinions rather than leading public opinion. What this data showed you is uh, public opinion can be shaped. And if you can increase public welfare, sometimes you have to do that against initial opposition. In fact, you should expect initial opposition. That's not something out of the ordinary. Um, let me just sort of say, uh, uh, give you a couple of slides on the power of labels and frames as we communicate uh, different choice alternatives. Uh, I was puzzled a few years ago about why uh, there was so much opposition against carbon taxes or a carbon tax. And at the same time, these uh, carbon fees that you can pay uh, when you fly across the country or when you do other uh, activities that involve carbon emissions, rising in popularity. They're basically sort of doubling each year they've been in place. 
Uh, and so we did a study, an online study, with a national representative sample in the United States, where we keep, gave people a choice between basically buying an airline ticket uh, with, that included this carbon fee, or the airline ticket without the fee. So there's an increase in something like uh, $7.70 uh, 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 for that. We had two pages of text that explained why the charge was what it was, uh, what was going to happen with that money, how it's going to offset your carbon emissions that came right off the websites where you can buy these, these, pay these fees uh, to, to get your offset. Uh, and the only word that we, diff that we varied between uh, subjects was we called this fee either a carbon tax or a carbon offset. But everything else was exactly the same. Uh, so people made that choice, and before they made the choice, they also we said, type out loud what goes through your mind as you make these decisions. And so we had that stream of consciousness, if you want, and we could code this for the arguments that people uh, generated. Um, and at the end of the study, we also asked them to tell us whether or not uh, they were Democrats, Independents, or Republicans with their political affiliation. So as you can see, that political affiliation made no difference uh, to uh, uh, buying this inclusive ticket, buying the ticket that included the carbon fee when the fee was called an offset. So basically Republicans and uh, Democrats looked identical. 67% bought the more expensive ticket that included the fee. As you can see, uh, it made no difference to the Democrats to switch from a carbon offset to a carbon tax. Yeah? But the percentage for Republicans goes down to 27%, so it made a huge difference. And if you look uh, at people's arguments, uh, when you ask a Republican uh, sort of to, to make that choice, and it's called a carbon tax, they basically sort of generate all sorts of arguments against that yeah, and nothing for it. They, they turn away from that option immediately. So again, what, which option gets considered first? The labels matter. If something has an attractive label that doesn't trigger, uh, it doesn't trigger uh, a, a knee-jerk reaction against that option, uh, it has a much higher chance of being accepted, so labels matter. Uh, and and, 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 and their, their, their protocols about what option gets considered first, in fact, mediates this, this, this response. Uh, turns out you can actually now change people's uh, choices oftentimes by telling them explicitly to generate arguments for one or for the other option uh, in sequence. Yeah? Uh, and that also has an effect on it. So you know, sort of basically sort of cueing people's attention uh, in, in, in ways that are different from our usual status quo biased fashion uh, also is a recipe for interventions. Uh, this and many other uh, theories uh, and also interventions, uh, recipes uh, for change uh, have been summarized uh, in a much more accessible way than in, 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 in journals, psychology journals, in a climate change communications guide that one of my centers, CRED, at Columbia has issued. It's available free for, for downloading. Just go to cred.columbia.edu slash guide. Um, and let me just sort of finish with a, a, a slide of lessons and caveats. Uh, take away from my presentation, and we can maybe discuss some of these in our uh, session later on. So I think one thing that's really important is to consider and utilize the full range of human motivations, of human goals, and of decision processes as we think about action uh, in the context of climate change. Beyond rational choice in the social planner model, uh, the IPCC in this round for the first time has done that. Uh, I played a small role in that, in fact. Uh, but I think we have to go much further than that because you know, sort of if we realize that people are not just rational processes but have all of these other goals and tools accessible, we can design interventions that are much more likely to get us uh, to our long-term goals as well as our short-term goals. Uh, I think we really need to learn how to focus on the positive consequences of change. You know, this this uh, fear appeals have not been very effective, so it's time to sort of be creative and try something different. Uh, think about why we can and why we should, not just why we can't. Uh, and, 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 and these positive consequences come at many different levels. First of all, climate change isn't all negative. Uh, Shipping uh, is looking at the northern route. The North, the North Passage has become free because you know, the, the ice is disappearing in the Arctic. It's 45% shorter, and there are no Somali pirates. Uh, if you think about sort of what's positive about individual action, maybe a new model and a new conceptualization of human happiness is something we can get in the bargain. You know, our current model on, that's consumption-based, you know, just acquiring larger houses uh, and being even further away from our place of work, is not working very well. You know, we're on this hedonic treadmill, and it's bad for the environment. Maybe a community-based model of, of human happiness will actually be better for all of us. Um, making change simple, yeah, to the extent that you can change the defaults. If you're an architect, change the default in the software that you're using to make uh, infrastructure decisions uh, for building yeah, or for transportation systems. Uh, innovative defaults. 
empowering people with lists of effective actions. Yeah, so when you have their attention, either by negative appeals yeah, or by positive appeals, tell them what it is they can effectively do, because that's not obvious to most of us. Yeah, and oftentimes, the lists that we get are not the, most, the best ones. Recycling, by the way, is not the best. The, 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 it's also not a silver bullet. Uh, and uh, also then having a focus on our long and successful pa uh, past on planet Earth, uh, reminding ourselves that we've been here for a long time, how much is at stake, in fact, is a way of motivating investment in the future. So I will finish here. Thank you very much, um, Professor Weber, for getting us started and um, outlining what the obstacles are, but also ending with a, a list of suggestions, um, possible solutions for the future, which is obviously our, is what we need. So uh, we're going to move on to our next speakers, Professor Stern, um, whose title uh, for today's talk is uh, Explaining Climate Change for Informed and Effective Response. Professor Stern. This is a very large subject, and uh, my, my 20 minutes are devoted to a piece of the subject. I want to say a couple of big picture things. First of all, one of which is that uh, in contrast to some of the other people on the panel who are going to be talking about psychological processes that uh, make it difficult to understand and deal with climate change, I'm going to emphasize the fact that climate change is inherently hard to understand. You know, regardless of psychological limitations, it's just difficult. Um, I also want to say a couple of other things to, to put this all into perspective. One is why I'm focusing on understanding. I believe that understanding is important. I don't believe that understanding, that better understanding leads in some automatic way to different behavior. Nor do I believe that individual behavior is, is all there is. I mean, Elke is right, we met the enemy and he is us and that sort of thing, but it's not just us as individuals, it's us as individuals, organizations, institutions, governments, and so forth. And Within the behavior of individuals, it's important to distinguish between the kind of habitual behaviors that, that Elke Weber is talking about and less frequent behaviors that uh, often take the form of investments, things that you do once. You uh, choose a place to live. You choose a way to, uh, to travel to the places that you, you work and shop and so forth. And you have some hardware that has greenhouse gas implications built into it, regardless of what you do on a daily basis. <clears throat> and one other point that, uh, that needs to be made up front in terms of understanding climate change is that there is a climate change denial social movement out there that is engaged in um, campaigns of disinformation that have been very effective and you know, the recent research by Aaron McCright, Riley Dunlap, and other sociologists who studied the public opinion data indicates that uh, this movement has very, been very successful in terms of polarizing thinking along lines of political party identification and political ideology, such that uh, beliefs about what's happening with the climate and even beliefs about whether there's a scientific consensus about climate change have become politically polarized in the United States. <clears throat> and uh, you, you can't forget about this when you're talking about improving understanding. <clears throat> so first of all, climate change is inherently difficult to understand. There are multiple parameters of climate involved. It's not just temperature and warming. It's precipitation, it's rain, it's snow, it's various kinds of extreme events. Um, <clears throat> There are seasonal, seasonal and, avu, and annual averages of each parameter in each place on Earth. There are distributions of various kinds of extreme events. It's, uh, it's intrinsically hard to tell whether climate is changing because what you see is variations in weather and other kinds of events, and they, they swamp the amount of climate change that the planet has experienced. And so it's hard to assess, assess whether there are changes in extreme events. And later in the conference, we will hear more about those because that's what vulnerability is about. Um, <clears throat> without accurate long memories and long records, it's just intrinsically hard to tell what's going on 
with climate change. A, a wise quotation that has been attributed to Einstein is that it's important to keep scientific explanations as simple as possible, but not any simpler. And uh, we have some explanations that are simpler than possible that are out there. Um, you know, one simple model is things won't change. There's extreme events, storms happen, droughts happen, hot and cold weather happen, and uh, you just go on as usual. You know, it's a, it's a default position, and it's a, it's a model that supports inaction. On the other side, you have the simple kind of model that appeared in President Obama's State of the Union message a few months ago, where he says climate change is a fact. You know, believe it, act on it, and this is a model that basically supports obedience to authority. The government says so, scientists say so, it's true, follow the policies that we advocate and everything will be fine. Of course, if you're not willing to do that, then you get into arguments about what about climate change is and isn't a fact. And uh, <clears throat> these are arguments that climate scientists engage in all the time. It's important that they do that. People who are not climate scientists tend not to do it very well. And so both of these simple models, I would say, are too simple. If you argue about facts, you can talk about um, you know, whether, whether there's some way of producing a deductive proof that climate change is happening, and there isn't. So you know, that kind of high school geometry method of determining what's scientific a fact is not applicable to climate change. Um, experimental science methods are not particularly applicable either. You can't experiment with the planet. So what you're dealing with is observational scientific methods. And uh, there's a tremendous amount of that kind of work that's been going on for many decades now. It's outside most people's competence to evaluate, but it's there. <clears throat> So there are some other simple models out there, and one of the ones that, uh, that you can infer from some of the political discourse is a criminal procedure kind of model, that greenhouse gases are innocent until proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt. And you, you see this kind of discourse coming out of the, uh, the climate change denial world, where they throw up questions about uh, of various kinds. Uh, for a long time, you had people like George Will saying there's been no global warming since 1998. Why 1998? It was an anomalously warm year. And if you start there, if you start with you know, by far the warmest year they've been experienced in 50 years, you don't expect to go up from there. But if you, you, know, if you look more broadly, <coughs> you, uh, you get different kinds of results. Anyway, there are people out there who are applying a sort of innocent until proven guilty kind of standard of proof, and that's a standard of proof that favors inaction. It requires that you, you need to answer every possible question before you can justify doing something. It's also an unhelpful model because we're not just talking about facts, first of all. We're acting on a basis of a mixture of facts, probabilities, and uncertainties. And you know, one of the, it's not too much of an exaggeration to say the only certain thing about climate change is uncertainty. There's going to be surprise. We don't know what all the surprises will be. <clears throat> we have some idea of what to expect, but we, we can't really predict with certainty. Another reason the model is unhelpful is that you don't need to have a definitive and final decision the way you do in a court of law. You know, once somebody's declared not guilty, they're free to go and nothing else happens. It's not like that. It's possible to make interim decisions, change your mind, adjust over time, and thinking about it in this way puts all of those possibilities out of mind. And also, there are more than two choices. It's not just guilty or not guilty. There's another simple model that you see out there. It's, it's the journalistic model. There are two sides to every story. And sometimes you'll see this in the press. We need to cover the climate denial arguments equally with the climate science arguments. 
and it's a you know it's an easy way out for a journalist. It also predisposes to inaction because as long as there's two sides to every story, uh, we are listening to the story and we're not deciding what to do. I think a more useful model comes from medicine. I say useful because it leads to asking good questions and considering realistic responses. In this model, you can think of the scientists as the doctors, the planet as the patient, and us as the guardians of the patient. And the analogy is that a panel of doctors has diagnosed the planet with a serious progressive disease that they call anthropogenic climate change. You know, as with some serious diseases, the symptoms aren't obvious in the early phases. You know, it's like hypertension or diabetes or some kinds of cancer. They can be very serious. You don't see much happening right away. What do you do? The disease could be just as serious as those on a planetary level. You have to decide what to do or ask your government to do in a situation, you know, and that, that situation is a little bit closer to what we're dealing with. <clears throat> the advantage of the medical analogy is that it prompts a series of appropriate questions. How certain are the doctors about the diagnosis? What are the likely outcomes if the causes are left untreated? What are the various treatment options? There are options for treating the causes. There are options for treating the symptoms. And treating the causes is in the, in the lingo called mitigation. You try to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Treating the symptoms, you put up seawalls to protect against storm surge. You, um, you have reservoirs to protect against drought, and you know, so on. Um, it's reasonable to ask for all of the treatments, what are the possible side effects of the treatments? Is the medical team missing anything? Are the doctors biased? You know, you, these, are, these are all reasonable questions to ask, and it gets the discussion in what I think are productive directions. Another advantage of the medical analogy is that it encourages you to think about adaptive response. What are the consequences of various courses of action and inaction? Are there ways to adapt responses and treatments over time as we learn more? You're going to continue to observe the patient while you're treating. And uh, <clears throat> things will happen, and they will give you additional insights, or they might. New measurement techniques, new tests might come along. And you know, thinking about it this way encourages you to think in those sorts of ways. Um, on, the, on the diagnosis side, to follow this analogy through a little bit more, <clears throat> scientists have pretty high confidence that the condition is present. We know what's causing it, emissions of carbon dioxide and other kinds of greenhouse gases. We have observed the increases in the emissions over time. We understand the etiology. We know which kinds of human activities are producing the greenhouse gases. We have a, a pretty good understanding of what the disease syndrome looks like, which, which systems in the planet are affected and in what directions. We have a you know, pretty good idea of the, the nature of the disease progression, although we can't predict specifics very well very far into the future. We know the patient is showing more and more of the syndrome, but it has its ups and downs. There's strong confidence that the syndrome is present. In terms of prognosis, <clears throat> is not as well understood. <clears throat> we know the nature of the condition. We know the disease is progressive. It's very hard to reverse. We know that the processes that cause it have been increasing. The symptoms have been increasing. We know that it will get worse without treatment. What we're not so sure about is the speed of progression. What kind of symptoms will appear where and when and how seriously? Which systems will show serious breakdown first? Not so sure about that. The probability of particular outcomes in particular pl places and particular time frames is also less clearly known. And you know, the <clears throat> various uh, kinds of scientists are working on this. They're debating it. They're looking at the evidence. And they're trying to, uh, trying to improve the ability to make prognostic judgments. Then there are the treatment issues. We know what the treatment objectives are. You want to improve the prognosis for the patient at relatively cost, low cost and with limited adverse side effects. You want to avoid cures that might be worse than the disease. 
You want to consider for each treatment the chances of improvement, the potential side effects, the untreated prognosis. And you will want to avoid the dangers both of undertreatment and of undesirable side effects. So as I said, mitigation is the technical term for treating the causes. You can eliminate all the symptoms if you do enough mitigation soon enough, but the treatment can be painful. It can be expensive. It can cause conflict. <clears throat> treating the symptoms, adaptation is the term for that. Raising seawalls, improving preparedness, and so forth. Reduce the symptoms. They don't slow the progression of the disease. In terms of choices, the medical analogy suggests there are no risk-free choices. The longer the treatment is postponed, the more painful it will be and the worse the prognosis will be. People disagree about the right course of treatment. It's possible to use iterative treatment strategies. Treat, see what happens, adjust. <clears throat> I would argue that thinking about the choices in this way might get people to talk more about the choices and less about whether climate change is a proven fact. What are we going to do? What are the options? OK, there are questions about second opinions. And you know, how do you judge? what the scientists are telling you, and I, I list a few rough and ready ways to evaluate scientists. What are their reputations? Where are they getting their money from? How do they deal with disagreements? What kind of argumentation do they use? The medical analogy accomplishes some things, but it doesn't do everything, and I just have a little bit of time to talk about this. It shows that the condition is serious and progressive. It helps clarify the kinds of information that would help in making choices. It suggests that there are a lot of plausible action strategies. What it doesn't do is give a clear sense of how much change is needed, how soon, who has to change, how much, and how soon. It doesn't say enough about what the world will look like if you don't change fast enough. You would like to have simple explanations to explain, the, to help think about these things and what kinds of adaptations must be put in place as insurance. <clears throat> There's another very, very difficult concept that I, I want to underline in the little bit of time that I have left, and that is the concept of the long-term carbon budget. That the, the effect on this whole syndrome of greenhouse gas emissions is not dependent so much on what the emissions are this year as it is on what the emissions are over a long period of time, 50 years or so. And if you talk, as the New York Times did in an editorial a few days ago, about bending the curve, it's not about bending the curve. It's about the area under the curve over 50 years is what determines the speed of, of the condition that we're discussing. The ultimate amount of global warming depends on the long-term totals of emissions. The, it means the longer you delay, the faster the emissions need to be cut. You know, here's here's a, a chart from skepticalscience.com that has three curves. And you see these maximum reduction rates, which get to be very drastic. And you see global emissions going to zero in some of these curves. The longer you delay, the faster you have to get to zero. Now, can you get to zero? It's sort of hard to imagine getting to zero. So in, in the New York Times running out of time editorial of a few days ago, they said the world has only about 15 years left in which to begin to bend the emissions curve downward. Now, if, if, if you take this, you know, this, this set of emissions curves suggests that you don't have 15 years. The average annual change for the last decade in greenhouse gas emissions has been plus 2.7 percent per year, plus 2.7 percent. And we're talking about the total over 50 years. You know, so the longer you wait, the faster you have to drop. And this, this is why there will be a discussion later on in this conference about adaptation. You know, if, you, if you look at the potential for mitigation, I would say it's not that good. You know, here's, here's a chart with what's been going on in some of the major emitting countries over the past 20 years change per capita in the rich countries has been going down. And in China and India, it's been going up rapidly, change per capita. If you add in the population change, you get the total net change. And in the, in the USA and in the EU, 
the net change has been somewhere around zero for 20 years, which is not good enough. If you look at China and India, the net change has, you know, has been a you know, tremendous increase. Can you realistically achieve what we're looking for for mitigation? It's, uh, it will not be easy. What will it look like if mitigation falls short? Um, we have vague ideas about that. What kinds of adaptation must be put in place? My note to myself said, here's where the imagination particularly fails. I don't know. I mean, the, the hope is that we can do this iteratively, which we will have to. And there's a few references, and I've come to the end. Thank you, Professor Stern. I'm sure we will get back to discussing this medical model during uh, later on because it's um, uh, you know it's a, an interesting way we can look at the problem. I, I wish we had invited Dr. House here on the panel to uh, guide us through this. Um, one of the uh, factors that um, Professor Stern mentioned is this issue of change. Uh, we have noted how difficult already Elke Weber had um, told us about how. Uh, how many difficulties there are when we want to implement change. And this is actually a nice uh, and um, a way in which we can transition to our next speaker, Professor John Jost, uh, whose work, uh, a lot of his work, has been on, uh, on resistance to change. So we will learn more about why it is so difficult uh, to make people change, why resist it, we resist it so much uh, in so many areas of life, and uh, certainly when it comes to climate change as well. Grazie, Manuela. Hello to everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, it's, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here. I've been coming to these um, social research events on and off for at least 20 years, probably since I was a student at the old location. So it's a, a special honor for me to be here on this side of the podium today. So thank you. Resistance to change is one of the most fundamental and longstanding problems in social psychology. Uh, and in fact, the topic predates the modern founding of the discipline, uh, which is typically associated with Kurt Lewin. Lewin rejected as overly vague concepts such as habit and custom, which had been used by theorists as diverse as the American sociologist Thorstein Veblen and the British psychologist William McDougall to understand why most people are extremely reluctant and slow to change their attitudes and behaviors. Instead, inspired by experimental physics, Lewin sought to develop a field theory in which human behavior was seen as the product of internal psychological and external social force, forces, uh, both of which are capable of contributing to uh, behavioral inertia. During World War II, the US government sought Lewin's assistance in helping people to change their eating behavior in light of food shortages and rationing. And Lewin argued that Insofar as people form attitudinal and behavioral patterns in social groups, it should be easier and more effective to bring about change in a group situation rather than an individual uh, situation. And so he brought neighbors together, provided them with nutritional facts, and had them participate in open, democratically organized uh, discussions about food. And Lewin found that this method uh, was far more effective than any other in bringing about changes in buying and eating habits. Lewin's ideas, especially those uh, pertaining to internal cognitive and motivational uh, forces, were expanded upon by his most famous student, Leon Festinger, who spent the last 20 years of his career here at the New School. And Festinger pointed out that in order to escape an aversive psychological state that he called cognitive dissonance, people are prone to seek out information that confirms their pre-existing views and to avoid new information that might increase the existing dissonance. So for instance, a smoker, like Festinger himself, might seek out material that is highly critical of research purporting to show that smoking is bad for one's health and to avoid all information that supports such conclusions. Persuasion in cases like this is obviously no simple matter. Since Festinger's time, a great many factors have been identified by social psychologists that make people especially unlikely to change their attitudes and behaviors. Given time constraints, I can only mention a very few. But one factor 
has been called ego involvement, self-interest, personal significance, and vested interests. Uh, it will surprise no one, probably, to learn that on average, people who are financially dependent on the oil and gas industry will be more resistant to acknowledging and doing something about climate change compared to those who are not. Uh, but already we're talking about millions of people around the world. A second factor is social validation, group support, or peer pressure. People who live and work in communities that are highly skeptical about climate change will be more resistant than those who do not. Uh, as Lewin noted, if you want to unfreeze prior opinions, it may be better to work with members of such groups collectively rather than individually, counterintuitive as this may seem. One of my own mentors, Bill McGuire, demonstrated 40 years ago that people are more resistant to attitude change when they know that someone is trying to persuade them. And they build up a kind of immunity against arguments that they have heard before. Uh, I would guess that this is a fairly significant problem uh, with respect to communication and persuasion about climate change. And finally, we know that people are far more resistant to changing beliefs that are logically or psychologically connected to other beliefs and values that are important to them. And the classic example here is ideology, which can be thought of as a network of interrelated beliefs and values. People are highly resistant to persuasion when it comes to a uh, belief that is ideolog ideologically relevant because uh, if they change one belief, then they're obliged to reconsider other beliefs that are logically dependent on that initial belief or face the consequences, which might include cognitive dissonance as well as accusations of hypocrisy or inconsistency. This last factor, the role of ideology, has been the focus of my own research on motivated resistance to scientific information about climate change. And I would like to spend the time that I have left describing just a few uh, of the studies that we have conducted. So we know that skepticism about climate change is especially prominent among conservative white males, a strong majority of whom continue to deny that climate change is occurring, that it's problematic, and that it's the result of human activity. Despite the fact that environmental scientists have learned a good deal more about the causes, consequences, and manifestations of climate change over the last 10 to 15 years, we all know that ideological polarization has increased rather than decreased, as this graph shows. Uh, I assume that other speakers today and tomorrow will address the institutional aspects of ideological polarization. Uh, including a well-funded movement designed to manufacture uncertainty about the science of climate change, which Paul has already alluded to. I will focus instead uh, on an ideological factor which I refer to as system justification motivation, namely a Panglossian tendency to believe that the societal status quo is fair, legitimate, and if not ideal, at least pretty close to it. So we measure uh, system justification in a number of different ways, uh, but the most direct way is to measure agreement or disagreement with explicit attitude statements. Uh, I've listed here a few examples of items from both general and economic system justification scales. We find consistently that conservatives are more likely than liberals or progressives to endorse the first four statements and to disagree with the last one, that is to state that the American social, economic, and political systems operate as they should, and that by and large, people in our society get what they deserve. We also find that people who endorse these system-justifying statements are less concerned about environmental problems. They're more skeptical about climate change, and they're less likely to report engaging in ecologically-minded behaviors. Importantly, we think, scores on these system justification scales statistically mediate uh, or account for the effects of political ideology and gender on skepticism about climate change and lack of support for pro-environmental policies. That is, system justifying beliefs help to explain why conservatives and men are less likely than progressives and women to acknowledge environmental problems and to favor taking action. My students and I have also found that system justification motivates skepticism about climate change by encouraging biased forms of information processing that affect the evaluation of and memory for scientific data and even tactile perception. For instance, Aaron Hennis and I 
exposed rural Midwesterners to excerpts from a genuine Associated Press newspaper article uh, about the 2010 controversy over typographical and other errors contained in the report issued by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. After reading uh, the article, participants evaluated the quality of scientific evidence concerning climate change. They reported their own beliefs, and they completed the economic system justification scale. And as we anticipated, individuals who scored higher on economic system justification, that is individuals who believe that the economic system is basically fine as it is, evaluated the scientific evidence for anthropogenic climate change to be significantly weaker and their evaluation of the evidence statistically mediated their degree of skepticism about climate change in general. And so all this suggests that one way in which defenders of the status quo maintain their skepticism about climate change is by derogating the quality of scientific information. In follow-up experiments, we've demonstrated that temporarily increasing system justification motivation that is, the desire to believe that the status quo is fair, legitimate, and justifiable causes people to process information in a biased manner so that the credibility of scientific concerns about climate change is undermined and skepticism is sustained or increased. So in one study, uh, college students were first exposed to a manipulation of system dependence, uh, which has been shown in prior research to increase system justification motivation in a variety of contexts. Specifically, half of the participants were led to believe that, according to social science research, the quality of their lives is highly dependent on the system. In this case, the government, the economy, uh, and other institutions and policies. The other half were uh, instead told that the system has little effect on their livelihood and well-being, and so we expected they would be less motivated to justify the status quo. We found that participants who were randomly assigned to the high system dependence condition did, in, did indeed report feeling more dependent, so the experimental manipulation worked, and more importantly, these participants expressed greater skepticism about the existence of climate change than did those who were assigned to the low system dependence condition. Participants assigned to the high system dependence condition were also more likely to misremember evidence pertaining to climate change in a way that facilitated denial and skepticism. So, um, for instance, they were less likely to remember the correct proportion of carbon emissions, just shown here in green, believed to be the product of power plants, cars, or trucks, as described in the newspaper article that they had read just a few moments, a few minutes before. Uh, only 21 percent of participants assigned to the high system dependence condition answered this question correctly, as compared with 64 percent in the low system dependence condition. <clears throat> and in fact, everyone who was assigned to the high system dependence condition who chose an incorrect ratio underestimated the problem of carbon emissions due to these sources, which was not the case in the other condition. Participants assigned to the high system dependence condition were also much less likely to recall that errors in the climate change report were actually discovered by climate change scientists, including a co-author uh, of the initial report, than were participants assigned to the low system dependence condition. Only 36 percent got this question right in the high system dependence condition as compared with 60 percent in the low system dependence condition. And in fact, 29 percent of participants assigned to the high system dependence condition falsely reported that errors were discovered by scientists who were skeptical of global warming. And only 4 percent of participants assigned to the low system dependence condition made this mistake. Okay. Everyone knows you can tell whether global warming is real just by going outside. Right? Uh, and several studies reveal that people believe more in climate change on warmer days than on colder days. So we hypothesized that people who are chronically high in economic system justification and people who are temporarily made to feel more dependent on the system would be motivated to perceive the temperature outside as cooler insofar as perceiving cooler temperatures facilitates skepticism about global warming. In one study, for instance, our research assistants um, approached adults in Washington Square Park, just a few blocks away from here, on a summer's day, and asked them to estimate the current temperature. We found that ideology was indeed related to perceptions of the ambient temperature. 
participants who scored higher on economic system justification reported the temperatures to be significantly cooler than did those who scored lower in system justification. In addition, uh, perceptions of the outside temperature partially mediated the effect of economic system justification on belief in climate change, suggesting that biased tactile perceptions may also facilitate skepticism. We replicated this study with an experimental manipulation of system dependence. And just to be sure that economic system justification was not associated with temperature underestimation in general, we repeated this procedure indoors in the laboratory, and we found that system justification there was unrelated to indoor perceptions. Uh, so the effect only seems to be present when it has some psychological bearing on belief in climate change. <coughs> So I interpret many of these kinds of results to be in line with system justification theory, which holds that uh, to varying degrees, people are motivated, often at a non-conscious level of awareness, to defend, justify, and bolster aspects of the societal status quo, and that this is an important psychological and ideological contributor to resistance to change. The strength of this motivation varies according to both individual or dispositional and social or situational factors. I'm not saying that social change is impossible. I'm saying that it's difficult for psychological as well as for other reasons. But it follows from this general approach that people should be less defensive uh, and more open to new possibilities when potential changes are described as congruent rather than incongruent with the values and ideals of the overarching social system. Uh, and so in a final uh, line of work that I would like to um, describe just very briefly, we hypothesized that if conservatives and high system justifiers are resistant to pro-environmental initiatives because they don't want to admit that something is wrong with our socioeconomic system, or they don't want to change their own behavior, or to advocate significant changes to the status quo, then it might be possible to harness their system justification motivation on behalf of the environment simply by reframing pro-environmental initiatives as patriotic and consistent with the goal of protecting and preserving the American way of life. <coughs> and it worked. When the need for pro-environmental action was system sanction that is described as congruent with the preservation of the American system, we found that high system justifiers were, mu were much more committed to helping the environment and more likely to sign a pro-environmental petition. So although I would um, not describe my own views um, about the present environmental situation as especially uh, optimistic, uh, largely because of the many social psychological forces, including system justification motivation, that contribute to resistance to change, these last findings uh, do give me uh, some hope, at least, that uh, something can be done sooner rather than later. So, thank you. Okay, we, uh, we moved on to, to some data, as you would expect from psychologists. Uh, we like to, to uh, bombard you with this. And um, my expectation is that we're going to get a few more uh, data now from uh, our last speaker, uh, Jennifer Jacquet, um, who is going to talk about some experimental insights, uh, testing climate change decisions uh, in the lab. Jennifer. Good afternoon. I really love experiments, so I wanted to uh, I'll just go back to my slide here, um, to talk about experiments because they're so, I think, fun and possibly enlightening. While we can't experiment with the natural science side of things so well, we only have one Earth, there's no game we can really play here, we can experiment with human psychology and decision making, which is what I'm interested in. And we had this nice talk on the sort of system, the economic systems thinking that we're trapped in, especially here in the US. but. This is a perfect lead-in to, to what I'd like to li then lead into my talk, just to say that we had also a very strong system thinking about the rational economic model for many decades. Uh, a very good example is if you have inelastic supply, sort of constant supply, and demand increases, 
price should also increase however much demand increases, essentially. There's nothing uh, limiting that from a free market perspective. And yet, as those of you know who um, lived in New York through the winter, this brutal winter we've just been through, when Uber tried surge pricing to charge seven times more for this exact rational model of inelastic supply, hike in demand, what happened? People got really upset, and in fact, Uber is being now um, taken to court, essentially, or considered being taken to court over this move, which is just follows a very rational economic systems thinking, free market neoclassical model. And if they had, uh, Uber had understood experiments, they would have known that this actually falls outside of consistent uh, psychological behavior uh, among their, their audience and their clients. So this is an experiment by Danny Kahneman and uh, et al., Richard Thaler's on there, Jack Netsch, about a very similar question. A hardware store has been selling snow shovels for $15. The morning after a large snowstorm, the store raises the price to 20 Please rate this action. Is it fair, unfair, acceptable? 82% of people considered it unfair for them to do that. This is in 1986, 30 years before our uh, snowstorm here. So we actually have great experimental evidence to show that a lot of the systems thinking we have doesn't even quite match up with what we all agree at, on as fair or unfair behavior, among other things. And what I like is the rise of behavioral economics really occurring, born in, in let's say, 70s, 80s, rising now, probably at its peak at this very moment, is actually even having, so books like Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, Thaler and, and Sunstein's Nudge, culminations of their, their academic work, but having an effect in politics. So you have uh, Danny Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow on the table uh, of Obama's uh, bedside table. He is talking about having read it and the limits to rationality in government. You have the nudge unit implemented by the UK government. These are, they're attempting to unravel the system a little bit and incorporate behavioral insights from experiments. Uh, so to me, experiments have a great, pro great promise as we've seen. And what we also have seen happening is that we see a shift in the climate change movement from the hard natural physical sciences toward the social sciences. So Dale Jameson, who you'll hear from tomorrow, has argued that the IPCC actually should have disbanded after the 2007 report and, and sort of reinvented itself actually as a social science institute or intergovernmental panel to figure out it's no longer the natural science that's going to, to move uh, the, the ball that the rest of us now also need to take charge and begin um, helping in the crisis. It's no longer just about the natural sciences. And we see that with the American Psychological <coughs> Association's report in 2009, all the great work being done here. Th there, are sci there are scientists doing this work, but to have it be the driving force now, um, let's say rather than the physical or natural scientists, I think this is actually the future. So we've heard already a lot about great experiments. This is another one of my favorites um, by Atari et al. in Proceedings Natural um, Academy of Sciences, just showing that the number one thing, at least, that Americans, over 500 Americans surveyed, say that you can do to save energy is turn off the lights. So this is nice showing that we have huge misconceptions about what we actually can do toward the problem of climate change. So this is a good first step. We need to identify what we don't know um, we already heard about LK's study on uh, framing effects, so if we frame it as an offset versus a tax, also regulation, uh, support for regulation. We think about everybody in, in, in my lab will just say, tax carbon, tax carbon, we chant it. But the word tax uh, doesn't appear to, to frame the issue well in, uh, in light of uh, Republican sentiment. So these are great. Um, findings, things that we have to be very cognizant, cognizant of, maybe things we can even work around, as John was pointing out. I'm interested in a very small subsect of experiments. Um, as you can tell, I'm still uh, the, the lowest ranked in my career on this panel, so I need to talk about a very small area of research. And luckily, there are only a few of these experiments, so I can tackle them in these 20 minutes. 
So there are a lot of these things called public goods experiments. Those are basically six-player games um, that are kind of like the prisoner's dilemma, which you've probably heard about. You probably saw it um, in the film The Dark Knight. The fairy scene is a classic prisoner's dilemma. They just show a tension between the individual and the group. We're looking at now cooperative decision making. So the experiments we've heard about so far are about individual decision making. We want to know how do we behave in the, as a group, given that this is such a group pro uh, problem. So we can test whether decision making uh, varies from the theory that we have on how groups or individuals make decisions. There's also, we can set up games, game theory experiments that have many rounds. So we can look at how behaviors change over time. And what we know for certain from these experiments, which have been done hundreds and hundreds of times, um, is that cooperation is highest at the beginning. It erodes over time, which is this classic tragedy of the commons problem. Punishment often outperforms reward in terms of encouraging cooperation. And that reputation can be used to enhance cooperation. But I could never tell you about all of these studies. There's no time. I don't know them all. But I can tell you about a, this subsect of cooperation experiments framed around climate change. So the first one being published in 2006. This is showing you, again, how new um, this application is and I think hopeful for how we move forward in, in understanding behavior. So I'll just give you an example game so that we can all get on the same page. And then we can talk about some of the results. So you, we get six players in a lab. We divide them so they can't talk to one another or see one another, which they'll say, well, that's not really like real life. But maybe it is kind of if we think about, uh, I don't know, Sudan and, and the US engaging in some sort of political agreement. And then we give them often a computer with, that they use to uh, report and, and examine other people's decisions. Those decisions are all anonymous so that they are, are not individually linked to, to their decision making, but they can see the other player's decisions, but they're anonymized. We give them, let's say, in this case, 40 euro endowment. So every player that comes in gets 40 euros to start the game. Uh, all of these experiments so far have been run in, uh, in, in Europe. So that's also a consideration we should all be keeping in mind, especially given John's presentation about you know, how wacky we are here. <laughs> so zero uh, to four euro choice. So they can give zero two or four euros at, 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 over the course of 10 rounds to this climate account. And so far, um, most of the experiments that have been done have used this climate account, used the real money donated in the game to invest in something like an ad. So we've done our experiments in Germany. Uh, the money has been invested in an ad that runs in the, the local newspaper that helps encourage information and awareness about climate change. This is a great way to funnel academic money into public awareness. <coughs> So if the uh, students achieve, so these are normally six undergrad students, achieve the 120 euro climate account goal. So this is like averting dangerous climate change. You guys have done well. You had 10 rounds. You all cooperated. You actually get, each player gets an additional 45 euros. So you can see the egalitarian outcome, the one that serves everyone best, is, um, is for everyone to give, sorry, let's go back, everyone to give 20 euros each, and then they each get 45 euros. If they do not give uh, 120 euros, they just walk away with whatever they have left of those 40 euros they came in and started with. So here's uh, an egalitarian outcome. Everybody gave 20 euros on their computers. They all lose 20, but they gain 45. So everyone in that game walks away with 65 euros. This is a no-brainer, right? If I said to you, here's 40 euros, do you want to give me 20? I'll give you 45 more. You would have no prob problem making this decision. You would do it in a heartbeat. And yet, if we put in the element of cooperation, things fall apart. And this is what's concerning. This is data from an actual game we ran. So you can see uh, the players, this was a, a successful egalitarian outcome, more or less. Some players gave slightly more or less than others. But most, most everyone walked away with roughly the same amount of money. And this is some uh, data from another real experiment where they did not achieve the outcome, and everyone walks away with far less money, actually, than they could have had had everyone cooperated. So this is just a nice metaphor to understand the dynamics of cooperation and climate change. Again, these games are all framed around climate, so the students have that on their mind when they're making the decisions. 
So in the first uh, experiment that I mentioned in 2006, what they did was they um, had different treatments where they gave some students lots of information, technical information, um, scientific information about climate change, and uh, some conditions where they could uh, not see one another. That's just a, a cue, where they were not anonymous, where they could build a reputation and knew who, who one another was. And the outcome uh, from those experiments show that knowledge does matter. So of course, John showed us another way that knowledge matters, but in this case, uh, with German students, um, having more technical information on the science of climate change led to more donations. So that's this um, top red group. You can see the, t the two euros on average went way up. Um, and that's the sort of altruistic response, because they could give zero, one, or two in this experiment. The open boxes um, in both sides, and the little informed and well informed, represent anonymous conditions. So this is to show, again, the power of reputation in the climate movement. And there are lots of attempts to glom onto this, and I think they'll probably increase in the future. Oops. What just happened now? OK. <clears throat> then another uh, experiment uh, manipulated the, the issue of risk. So we have a lot of uncertainty around certain aspects of climate change and, uh, and projection <laughs> equipment. And so uh, there were three conditions. There was a 90% chance that they would risk all of their, um, basically the, that additional endowment if they didn't uh, donate to the, the, if they didn't reach the 120 euro mark. There was a 50% chance they would lose it. And then there was a 10% chance they would lose it. So that, that's just to say that all of them would get those, that additional 45 euros with varying degrees of uncertainty. So each group faced the same amount of uncertainty, but um, we varied the, the, or they, the experimenters, varied the amount of uncertainty. So let's just see if this works. So this just shows you, um, again, sort of a lot of these experiments confirming our suspicions about um, how, how behavior would respond. But with high levels of uncertainty, we can get very, actually got zero cooperation. So even at a 50% chance, 50-50 chance that if you don't make the 120 euro target, you're going to lose everything, only one out of 10 groups cooperated. Even under 90% certainty, which a lot of natural scientists would say is kind of like some of the best levels of certainty you're going to get in any prediction, only five out of 10 groups cooperated. Half of groups are cooperating under that even just 10% level of uncertainty. So here's a big challenge of overcoming our, our impressions and decision making around uncertainty. Another issue that we're all familiar with is that, yeah, everyone in our experiment comes in and they get 40 euros each. But that's not the way the real world works, right? We have very, very powerful players and very weak players within the climate game, if you want to call it that. So we tried to, uh, or experimenters tried to imitate this in the lab. I say we because one of my collaborators is the head uh, author on this study, but it's very unfair of me to take any credit for this. I didn't, I didn't do this experiment. So all six players in this game come in. They get the 40 euros. But then they, there were some manipulations. And then they would get 60 euros each if they contributed and, and made the 120 euro mark. But in uh, another treatment, they varied it so that three players got 40 euros, but, and then three players got 20. So this was like a rich, <coughs> poor scenario, more like the, the real, I, I would say, more similar to the real world. And in that case, also the endowments were different. So the payoffs, in the case of the, the poor scenario, were also um, Half as half as big, so this was uh, just showing that the rich right had more capacity of, uh, to contribute to that 120 euro mark than the poor did. And then there there was another condition in which all six players were were each only got 20 euros, which meant they would have each had to give in everything to reach the 120 euro mark, and then they could would each get 30 euros. Still a rational choice by any economist. Uh, understanding, but very hard to achieve the minute you add in cooperation. So uh, at the individual level, very rational. Once you put the group setting prisoner's dilemma, it predicts actually defection. So in this scenario, the rich-poor conflict, 
What they found helped achieve success in this game was having an intermediate target for the players. So you can see the, the, the sort of different dynamics over 10 rounds. But if they said, you have to reach 60 euros by round five in order to even keep advancing without any uncertainty of losing your money, this was easier for groups to achieve, even with mixed settings, uh, rich and poor, than if they had no intermediate target. Now, if all players were the, the poor condition, uh, they uh, had the erosion of cooperation over time um, in, the, in the scenario without immediate climate target. They did manage to meet the intermediate climate target in the poor condition, but then did, failed to reach it at the, um, at the tenth round. This is just to say, I think, that intermediate targets are an interesting policy option then, something to explore further, especially in the lab. <clears throat> and then uh, the final experiment is one uh, that, that I helped with. And uh, in this case, what I realized was that all, all of these games, the payouts of cooperation, the benefits of cooperation, people were getting them immediately after the game. And to me, this also was a mismatch between what's really happening in the real world. Actually, what's happening is we're being asked to pay for the future to have some benefit. And at the same time, we're benefiting a lot from fossil fuels, right? And the future is going to pay the costs of that. So I wanted to design an experiment where we could uh, try to change the, the timing on the payouts, the benefits of cooperation. So when those students got the additional en endowment, we tried to change. And in one case, uh, we gave them the benefits of cooperation tomorrow, so that if they made the 120 euros as a group, the next day each student came back and received their 45 euros. In the intragenerational uh, situation, where they were still receiving the benefits, um, they, got the, they had to wait seven weeks, essentially, for the, um, the payout. And then we had an intergeneration, between generation component where we said, if you achieve the 120 euros, we're going to take all of your endowment and invest it in tree planting. And this will actually help offset uh, climate change, oak trees, and uh, they won't be harvested, and the future generations will, will receive the benefits of this. And in this experiment, um, you can see the majority of groups cooperated when it was only one day later. The minority, but still some groups, cooperated when the payoff was seven weeks later, and zero of the 11 groups managed to achieve the 120 euro target if it was an intergenerational payoff. So again, the timing of benefits really confounds our um, ability to cooperate with climate change, as we know. I think what's interesting is that some groups, and especially one in particular, got very close to the 120 euro mark. And the question is, why? This, is, this gives a perfect case, again, where we defy sort of the rational model. We have other values other than our own self-interest, it's clear. And tapping into that, manipulating it, figure out what, figuring out what, what uh, allows people to make decisions in favor of future generations, I think could be a, a big advance. So uh, just to end the talk by saying, in the same way that uh, we are taking Uber now to task, and uh, its reputation was severely damaged on the basis of actually be behavior we knew, we knew intuitively and also in the academic literature was unfair. Um, I think we also have to wonder and hope that some of the research happening here, um, certainly our own intuitions uh, about how we are behaving also at the po political level uh, <coughs> is questionable. So I think the, the, the real question is also, how do we take on the economic systems that might not be reflecting the behavior that, that we see in the lab or that we, in, we intuitively think that uh, should be made in the, at the international scale? Thank you very much.